Dowsing is a natural ability of every human being and is closely aligned to intuition. Positioning dowsing alongside our other human intuitive abilities starts to say something really interesting, not only about us, but also about the world around us. If you stick around for this two-part summary, you'll see how developments in science have moved from the classical structure to various quantum models, alongside all of which we can neatly place dowsing as a question and answer mechanism with its own structured validity. And one thing you'll also be assured of is to realize that the world is most definitely not what it seems. Hello there, my name's Tim Walter. I'm a house healer and alternative life coach. A few decades ago, I had a life-changing experience that led me to be convinced that the world is not what it seems. We can all live a balanced and harmonious life by connecting simply and easily to our intuition, to nature, and by harnessing our own subjective view of the world in which we live. This channel features techniques that I use deeply in my work as a house healer, but I'm sharing my experience so that you can use those same basic techniques and knowledge in your day-to-day -day worlds for your own improved well-being. Topics we cover include meditation, mindfulness, and dowsing. So if that sounds like the sort of thing that you're interested in, then click on subscribe and do join me when you can. Today, I'd like to encourage you to pull up a cup of tea and settle down to listen to a fascinating talk by Ian Jamieson, physicist and engineer, in which he outlines how science has developed theories of quantum consciousness that lead to some extraordinary and mind-blowing conclusions. In part two, we'll see how these theories lead to theories about how dowsing might work from a modern scientific perspective. So settle in, enjoy this first part of the two videos in which Ian gives us a potted history of developments in science from the classical view of the universe into the quantum. And next time, he hints at where that may take us as potentially spiritual beings. Here he is then, Ian Jameson. Ian. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having this conversation, because uh, last time uh, it was absolutely fascinating and you completely wore my brain out. I expect the same again this time. I have felt for a long, long time that dowsing is a quantum process. Now, I don't expect that you're going to say, yes, of course, here we are. What I'm looking for is that, that you can share some of your knowledge um, and your understanding of perhaps quantum consciousness um, and your knowledge of the, the more esoteric side of life. So is there any, any way that anything that you can tell us about the connection between science and spirituality and, and sort of leading in on to that sort of aspect of quantum consciousness? Yes, yeah, so I try, uh, before I go into the details and I'm gonna actually uh, share other people's idea of quantum consciousness, I'm gonna talk about Henry Stapp and um, also uh, Roger Penrose and Amit Goswami. And I'm also gonna talk about Julian James a little bit uh, and his ideas. So, but I wanna zoom out just a little bit. You're talking about spirit, uh, spirituality and science. I, I perceive those two things as two sides as the same coin. They're both trying to describe reality, um, whereas science comes at it from the point of view of measurement and also repeatability. It's a more, um, sort of uh, physical process in terms of what we uh, uh, consider as the physical world. Whereas, um, whereas uh, and it's objective, it, it tries to be objective. Whereas with um, spirituality, it's an inner experience often. It's not measurable. It's certainly often not repeatable either, but they both uh, complement each other. So uh, there's some overlap. And I think where they overlap actually is in the what we call the quantum world. Now, you know my feelings about um, using quantum uh, theory to explain things. You have to be very, very careful uh, because basically it was originally founded as a mathematical formalism, just symbols and uh, formulas and everything to make predictions. But we can't deny that there are quantum effects when we do experiments and that, like the entanglement, quantum entanglement and things like that, uh, which, which implies sort of some connection beyond space and time. So you just have to be careful where you tread with uh, quantum theory and, and not try to go too far with it and explain everything in terms of it and just be careful uh, with the definitions and everything. So I'm going to try and, before I go into the quantum consciousness, I, I just want to talk a little bit about science 
how it works, um, because often the two things, science and spirituality, are seen as, as completely disparate subjects. But we have to remember that science is, is a, is a uh, subject that uh, has its own limitations as well. With spirituality, of course, limitations, we, we sometimes can't repeat the experience and things like that. Uh, so let's start with just a general overview of science. When Newton, Isaac Newton came along, of course, there was a, um, a single time, universal time. The idea was there was bits of particles, uh, atoms floating around in the uh, space and time and interacting and that sort of thing. And science was seen, started off with uh, Newton and Galileo as having a sort of mathematical structure as well. And it was built, uh, it started off with uh, people like Kepler as well, taking, you know, getting data from uh, Tycho Brahe, uh, or Bra, I think they pronounce it Tycho Bra, uh, the Danish astronomer. And with that data, he got a lot of data and he was basically distilling that data down into a, a general sort of formula. And that's called the inductive method where you collect data and then you, you, you sort of uh, generalize down to some sort of formula about the orbit of the planets uh, around the sun, that sort of thing. Um, now, the, it was, I think, uh, David Hume came along around about the time of Newton or after Newton, something around about there. I can't remember the precise time, but he wrote um, a, a, a couple of books his first book, and I can't remember which way around the books were, his first book uh, was was not as well, uh, um, it fell on deaf ears. His second book was a, a little bit stronger. And he really questioned the whole inductive method. And he came out with this idea about the, and you often hear this, this uh, um, phrase about the black swan events. And I don't know if you've heard that uh, black swan events, like uh, something happens that no one's expected, and so the stock markets crash and things along that, that sort of thing. Yeah. But Hume really, he really sort of muddied the waters when it came to in, inductive thinking, which science is based on the inductive uh, process. He said that basically, well, you know, uh, you can always say with science, well, every time I look out my window, I always see white swans. And so I can come up with that data and make a statement that all, sw uh, all swans are white. However, we can go on for years doing that, and then a black swan turns up. Well, you know, that's the inductive method out the window, really, for him, because as, he's, as, you, um, as you keep looking and you keep confirming your idea that all swans are white, doesn't mean there aren't black swans around. And, uh, of course, that could turn up one day. So the inductive method is a limited thing in his, his idea. And so science is limited in the fact that even though people come up with theories and hypotheses, that and they keep testing them. You test the hypothesis and you um, keep confirming your, your hypothesis until it, you know, becomes a theory, then a law, and that sort of thing. There might well be a time when some data comes in and sort of shows your theory is not correct, mm -hmm. or it's a limiting case, or something like that. So that's one thing. And you also cast out on the high, uh, whole idea of, of uh, causality, um, that um, you know, event B is caused by event A. If you see event A enough times and event B follows it every time, you can infer that A causes B. But his point was that uh, there's a difference between correlation. The fact that A and B are correlated in some way doesn't mean that A causes B. So he also sort of uh, cast a shadow of the whole idea of causality. His idea was that, uh, you know, the brain is just a bundle of perceptions that it gets from the world. And from those perceptions, it somehow comes up with an idea about reality. And the brain, of course, is a great correlator. It sees correlations in things, and, and from that, it infers causality in time and everything. So there's a lot of argument about the, this limit of science, and it was uh, Karl Popper who came along. Um, Sir Karl Popper came along a bit later in, in his book, uh, The Logic of Scientific Discovery. He actually laid out that, the, that science indeed does have its limits, and uh, that, but those limits are okay as long as we see it's it's a process that we go through. We make a hypothesis, we keep confirming it, we keep confirming it, and uh, you know as long as we keep confirming that our, our hypotheses and our theories, then um, the theory stands. But if some data comes along at a later time that uh, it doesn't fit in with the, the the theory, then we can sort of do an ad hoc um, uh, change to the theory and make it fit. 
Uh, we can modify it. We can make, for example, with Newton's laws, special relativity came along after Newton's laws, and uh, it showed that uh, Newton's laws were limited. So it's a limiting case of some greater theory, or we can actually abandon it and then come up with a different theory. And indeed, uh, Thomas Kuhn came along as well with his book on the, um, what was it now, the logic of scientific revolution, um, something like that, or so, something like that, the book, I can't, I can't remember exactly. But uh, he, he came along and said, well, there, there are these uh, big revolutions that, that happen where you can't make one theory just a limiting case. You have to abandon it all. For example, the idea that the Earth was the center of the solar system, you know, persisted for a long time. And then um, in the end, it um, came through Copernicus from he knew about the Greeks idea about uh, making the sun the center of the solar system. So science works in sort of a, a continuous manner going along. And uh, for a long time, the theories will persist, and Newton's laws persisted for a long time. Uh, another theory comes along which says, well, Newton's laws doesn't fit in very well with electromagnetic theory. And Einstein was able to show that, um, that Newton's laws are a special case for uh, slow speeds, slow relative speeds. But it works at those uh, slow relative speeds, but um, then uh, for higher speeds, we have to consider special theory of relativity. And so it fits in well uh, there. So uh, now with quantum theory, we've still got that sort of thing that we can still incorporate classical physics to some extent. However, I think most quantum physicists would agree, uh, particularly the theoretical ones, that really the world is not classical. We really have to abandon it. We could say it's a limiting case, but really the basic underlying um, form of the universe is, is quantum in nature. And of course, it was Max Planck who first noted that the oscillations of the molecules in substances had to be explained by quantizing their oscillations. And uh, later, it was noted by Einstein explaining the photoelectric effect that photons are like given off. Well, they're like given off by various things uh, were quantized. Uh, that was his explanation for the photoelectric effect. Um, and he won the Nobel Prize, Prize for that as well. It's great. It's absolutely brilliant. I just wanted to ask a really basic question. Because yes. Because a lot of people will be familiar with the, the, the term quantum uh, consciousness or quantum physics or whatever. Mm. But when you talk about um, uh, uh, Max Planck being the first one to quantize oscillations, so what do you mean by the actual quantize? What do you mean by the, using the expression oh. that then, you know? Yeah, okay, okay, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, so if you look into a fireplace or something like that, you, you would expect with classical physics that um, the radiation would start at the very low end, go through the visible spectrum, go through X-rays and gamma rays, and you get gamma rays and X-rays given off by a fireplace. Well, that's called the um, ultraviolet catastrophe, basically. And what that doesn't happen. What actually happens, you get this nice sort of curve, which um, is the signature of uh, a black body. What are called black bodies, which absorb all radiation and give it off. Um, uh, lo lots of th different things are black bodies. Actually, the sun is actually a black body as well, believe it or not. But so with black body radiation, um, when, you're, when it's radiating energy out, you would expect, actually, that the that the radiation, the energy that it's giving off would be spread out over all the different frequencies. That doesn't happen. They try to explain why it's this shape and it's not sort of, you know, going to be flat across or a statistical, more statistical distribution. And no one could explain it with classical physics. And, and the idea was that um, Max Planck, who's a brilliant physicist, German physicist, said, well, it's, it's not, um, that the energy is not a continuum. The, the energy that's given off appears to be, and he explained, uh, his formula explained the shape, it appears to be in little chunks, quantized. Quantum, you know, quantized. Right, that, right. That's, that's basically where it comes from. It, it appears to be, and he wasn't actually saying that the radiation given off by itself was quantized. He was saying that the oscillations of the molecules in the material that was being heated up, this, this material has been heated up and giving off this radiation, like a fireplace or something like that, um, that that was quantized, the oscillations. But then it soon became apparent that it's actually actually the the uh, electromagnetic magnetic energy as well was, was uh, quantized. And Einstein was one of the first to suggest that in the photoelectric effect where they tried to explain the chunks of energy where the energy is related to um, 
Planck's constant h was a very small number multiplied by the frequency. So uh, that's the idea, you know, that the quantum sort of started there. So it became known that light had a, a sort of dual nature. It was partly a, a particle and partly a wave. And de Broglie later on came along and said, well, if, if uh, electromagnetic energy that's a wave can have a particle nature, perhaps matter that we know as particles can have a wave nature. And so he uh, did some mathematics and showed that, yes, indeed, it, it is possible. But what was a matter wave? You know, and they did some experiments that showed that actually, you know, light waves can show interference patterns when you send them through two slits and they enhance each other or cancel each other out. And you get inter interference patterns. And uh, it, it turned out that uh, electrons do the same thing. If you pass them through two slits, you get interference patterns as well, where the, the particles seem to interfere each, with each other. So that shows they've got a sort of wave nature. So what was this wave nature? And it was Schrodinger, actually, the Austrian physicist. He sort of wrote out uh, his uh, famous uh, Schrodinger wave equations. There's a time-dependent one and time-independent one. We're going to be dealing with the time-dependent one here. And um, he put it in a format that sort of explained how you can have matter waves and how, they, how you could predict their state after a certain amount of time. Max Born, a German physicist, came up with the idea that, well, uh, the actual square of the um, psi, it's called, the, that describes the uh, evolution of the, the, this uh, quantum wave. If you take the square of that, it gives you a probability. So Max Born sort of came up with the idea that this wave that Schrodinger, the wave equation that Schrodinger derived for the matter waves, actually, if you take the square, which gives the, ampl the amplitude of that wave, gives the probability of finding a particle. So they're really probability waves. Basically. Right. Now, just going back, so I just don't, I want to talk about a couple of things here to just set us up to talk about quantum consciousness is why, why we're here, is that Heisenberg, of course, um, had this idea. And Heisenberg, he wrote a very brilliant book, actually, called Physics and Philosophy. He wasn't much of a philosopher at first. And he, you know, he and Niels Bohr are very puzzled by the, the, the findings they're finding about atoms giving off you know, quantized levels of energy and the photons coming off them, and why this was, and things like particles going through um, cloud chambers and why they, they appear to be in one place and then sometimes, you know, multiple places and things like this. So um, there was a lot of discussion between Bohr and Heisenberg in, in, uh, uh, in Denmark and also between them and Schrodinger about the meaning, the ontology, if you like, the existential meaning of what quantum theory is all about. Is it just a mathematical form formalism for uh, trying to predict what's gonna happen in the future? Or is it, uh, does it, does the, does the um, Schrodinger's equation, does the Schrodinger uh, quantum wave actually exist in reality? There's a lot of to and fro, but basically uh, Heisenberg discovered that there's really a sort of indeterminism in the universe, that some things like the momentum of a particle and its position that you cannot determine to be exact at any particular time. You know, if you, do, if you, if you figure out the exact position of a particle, then you know nothing about its momentum. And if you know the exact momentum, you know nothing about its position. It could be anywhere in the universe. And so, there, and of course, the thing when you multiply those two uncertainties together is sort of a greater or equal to Planck's constant. So it shows that there's a quantum, if you like, of uncertainty in the universe, an indeterminism in the universe. And this is rather uh, different to the way that classical physics uh, speaks about things, that we always imagine that um, at every moment, the universe is predetermined, uh, is determined by the previous moment. Yeah. And so basically, because our brains are made up of, of matter interacting, even our thoughts are predetermined from the very first moment at the beginning of the universe, um, even our thoughts now sitting here 14 billion years later, since they're just arrangements of molecules and all the rest of it, uh, configurations, they were predetermined. Um, so what does that say about consciousness? If, if our mind is, if our brain, let's stick with brain, uh, if our brain is uh, just has configurations of molecules and everything that are predetermined, well, where does free will come in? And we're going to talk about free will in, the, in, in terms of uh, consciousness. But quantum theory says differently. It says that there's an indeterminate, there's a certain element of randomness. When we take a measurement of something, 
um, by the fact that we observe a quantum system, we actually we are actually there's there's a, a, a random element involved in the whole process of measurement, and that causes indeterminacy, and that indeterminacy um, translates to um, indeterminacy in our thoughts as well. There must be some sort of process in the brain, some people think, that causes some indeterminacy, so it's not all predetermined, and that could be at the quantum level. So, so the idea between these uh, of these quantum um, theories of consciousness is that they tend to have, be based on this random element and indeterminate element. Now, I must say that one of the things that people get a little confused about with this whole quantum theory thing is that it's just that we don't know. It's, it's just that we don't know enough information about uh, the particle. The, the very act of um, looking at something disturbs it, and therefore we don't know uh, uh, where the particle is, or we, we can't, you know, we don't have the instruments to look at it, or, or something like that. So quantum theory is, is, is really comes down to the fact that we just lack the knowledge about what's really happening. It's not that. In, uh, the, accepted, the accepted way in quantum theory is that in between measurements, the uh, quantum particles don't actually have attributes. And um, really Heisenberg said this in, in his own way. It's only, nature only reveals to us its nature by the questions we ask it. In other words, the way we set up the experiments, we ask certain questions. Does a photon come through, um, uh, does it go through one slit or another? We're asking that question. Um, but if we ask it a different question, then we get a different answer to, to something. So he came up with the idea of potentia. So I'm going to explain this because this is important in one of the, the theories. And I have to explain some basic fundamental sort of quantum theory here to understand the, the theories of uh, quantum consciousness. So here we go. I think I, I probably left, left out a ton of stuff I was going to talk about, but at the time being what it is. Okay. Um, not, not that I exist. I, I actually don't. I don't actually accept that space and time exist anyway. So anyway, here we go. Um, so uh, Heisenberg in the end, end up came up with the idea, like Ar Ar the Aristotelian idea of potential, that when an artist looks at uh, a block of marble, you know, there's potential for different forms he sees in he or she sees in there, and those potentials are realized by an act, you know, that actualizes them. And Heisenberg actually saw, thought the same thing for the quantum world, is that in the quantum world, when a quantum particle has to make a decision, if you like, uh, it, there's, there's many different ways it can go. It spreads out into many different branches of possibilities. And it's only when we measure, it's only when we actually measure um, the, the thing we're looking at that we, what's called the quantum collapse of the system, collapses into one or the other. So let me give you an example that's often used in, in this, this, um, this situation, the famous half-silvered mirror. Now, half-silvered mirror is one which you can set up so statistically uh, the, 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 a photon can go through the mirror, get transmitted, go straight through, or it could, could be reflected off. So if you put a, a half-silvered mirror at 45 deg degrees to a, a photon beam, then it could either bounce off like this or go through. And there's basically, you can set it up so it's a full 50-50 sort of chance. Now, in the quantum world, and hopefully I haven't missed out any very important aspects of quantum theory here, and I'll explain them as I go through. Um, in, the, in, the, in the quantum world, and I want to say, I do want to say a couple of points here uh, after I've said this. So if a photon comes along, which we take the, and by the way, Niels Bohr, I want to make this point. Niels Bohr disagreed with Heisenberg a little bit. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, Niels Bohr came up with a complementarity principle and said that, look, um, when we talk about the quantum world, we can only talk about it in terms of uh, analogy, in terms of classical language. So we can only talk about a quantum particle um, in terms we understand because we have to communicate with each other and so we, we say in some circumstances, we, the way we set up an experiment, we see the, a, a photon or electron as a wave. And sometimes when we set up the experiment, if we're asking a different question, we'll see it as a particle. And it's either, it's not actually a particle or a wave. 
it's just the only way we can explain it, and it depends how we set up the experiment, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to say that. So he, he thought of it in a different way, way, but basically the standard theory is the way that Heisenberg more or less thinks about it, and I'll go a bit more detail on that. So anyway, so here's, here's the, the half silver mirror. Bum, bum. So if you actually do this experiment and you had a detector, say, that was in line, so here's the half silver mirror, and then there's a detector here, a half silver mirror detector. Nothing like a good diagram, right? <laughs> and and um, yeah, and and so we just have one detector. So if it goes through and it detects the photon here, then we'll say it went through. If it if it if it bounces off and gets reflected, it doesn't go through. We, we you know we don't see anything. We send one photon through at a time. So the system is such that with this, just the half silver mirror, it's called a superposition of the fact that the photon, so the actual um, wave equation describes the, the whole system would be, would be that uh, the state of that system um, would be that the photon doesn't go through, so a no, if it bounces off, and a yes going through. Okay. Now, because we're dealing in the quantum world, we're not gonna say it's one or the other at the moment because it's, a, it's, because it's both. And until we measure it, it's both, it's and. It's, it's no and yes, and, and it's going to stay like that. And um, just one thing about the, the quantum uh, Schrodinger wave equation, it actually describes the evolution of this quantum wave, how the thing progresses, and, uh, and, and it progresses over time. So it could actually look at this wave equation over time, and, it, and the actual evolution of the, the uh, Schrodinger wave equation so it describes it, it's deterministic. It is actually a deterministic thing, this how the wave equation evolves. And so any quantum particle of that, uh, if you describe it by a, a, the Schrodinger wave equation, how it actually evolves in time in the quantum world, if you like, without any measurements, it evolves deterministically. With this evolution of the of, uh, you know, particle moving through, we have a quantum wave describing this particle's uh, trajectory evolution over time in a de deterministic way. Um, now that could have many possibilities and that deterministic uh, evolution of the Schrodinger wave equation, there can be many, many ways that a particle can actually move. Uh, and, and that's the probability spread out. So an electron or photon can be anywhere in the universe at some point. So without actually measuring that, the whole system is evolving in, in time deterministically but once we take a measurement, once we put that detector in there and we detect the photon, or we don't det detect the photon, mm. whichever, as we send one through, we'll then know whether the uh, quantum particle, the photon went through the mirror or it reflected off. And once we do that, there is what is called a collapse of that uh, wave equation that describes the, the system, the experiment, the question we're asking of nature. And so now we have some more knowledge about the universe by that collapse. This is Heisenberg's sort of way of looking at it. It's actually not so much that we're understanding the reality of the universe, but that we gain some knowledge about something, some aspect of the universe. Um, even though we don't, before that, it was both, before we measured it, it wasn't one or the other. In other words, there wasn't actually an actuality involved there. It was both those particular situations were actually happening at the same time. So you can look at, uh, for example, another example is a quantum bit in, in a quantum computer. You know, if you have a, a quantum particle, you can say that, um, and by the way, one of the things of special relativity is you, that uh, uh, fundamental particles cannot have any volume. So they don't, a, a quantum particle doesn't actually spin, but it has a, a magnetic field and we can think of it as a spin up and a spin down. In, right. for the silicon, right. electron yeah. or whatever the quantum bits. So basically, uh, a quantum uh, bit is in a superposition, if you're using a quantum computer, a qubit is uh, you know, spin up or spin, and, and spin down. It's in both, it's an and. It's that and that. And so you can do, if you combine now two particles, so you've got a particle that's in a superposition of up, and down, and this one's also in a, a superposition of down and up, let's say that they can also be entangled 
that maybe we entangled those two. So now you've got a two quantum bit uh, uh, quantum computer. One of the uh, one of the things about quantum computers is that they have to be very specially constructed so that they don't get into any interference in the environment. Well, why is that? It's because if a photon came along and it interacted with that quantum bit, that's in a superposition of, of two things, people say, well, you'll get a thing called decoherence. And this is, the this is a bit of a technical bit here, which we need for later on, is that this particle um, that's in a, an and situation, it's both spin up and spin down at the same time. Once it gets decohered, once a photon comes in or some other sort of uh, particle or some something interacts with it in some way, what happens, that superposition, that the, the wave function that describes that uh, superposition is collapsed. Now, it's not necessary, and here's, a, here's a quite a technical detail here, is not necessarily collapsed into a classical state of a spin up or spin down. Okay. This, is, this is a bit on the edge for understanding because what you get is, is a thing called a mixed state and it's called a quantum mixed state and it's called a, a, a quantum orthogonal mixed state. It's, it's, it's both, yeah, it's just that one doesn't interact with the other. They're, 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 okay. they're, when they say orthogonal mixed state, it just means they can be matched to a classical state, basically, okay. of, of spin up or spin down. But it can still be a quantum state, but they're called mixed states. Okay. So that's called decoherence. And decoherence, a lot of people think that decoherence solves the measurement problem, which I'll explain in a moment with the half-silvered mirror. Um, but it actually, it actually uh, doesn't, um, because what happens when you get an interaction with a particle, it collapses into two uh, mixed states, which are quantum up, quantum down, one or the other. So before it's a superposition of up and down and the two ands together, and now it's one or the other. They don't go, the, the, the quantum states there, it doesn't collapse necessarily into a classical state. Yeah. The other thing can happen, the entanglement between these two separate particles can also be, um, the same thing can happen is that you, the, it can be, um, Collapse the wave function that describes the entangled states. Now we talked about entangled states. If you have two quantum particles and you take them apart, they can be entangled. So whatever you do to one instantaneously, if you move the spin of this one down, it instantaneously moves the spin of the other one up. The entanglement, it appears, it's a quantum pro uh, property that classical physics can't explain, and it appears to be some sort of connection beyond space and time. Not necessarily a, a signal that goes between two. So uh, decoherence can also affect that. Uh, so decoherence that can knock things into what's called quantum mixed states that are no longer superpositioned um, can be caused by the, the environment interacting. Um, and so in the brain, we've got this problem with it as well, which I'll describe in a moment. So going back to the half silver mirror here, when the uh, photon goes through, let's let's say it's one or the other, we measure it and we measure it as going through. So our, our detector here says, Yes, transmitted. It went through. Yes. Um, so we're asking that. We're asking the question: Does it go through or doesn't it? And we're given this. This it goes through. Now, um, and of course, if if uh, we know we sent a particle and uh, we we got a no, then it's it didn't go through. It got reflected. Now the thing is, and so. Most people think, well, that's it. It's it's being collapsed now. We're talking about probability in that aspect. So the probability of it collapsing in one particular way, is that what you're getting at or not? No, not quite. Um, so for example, if a, uh, let's explain it like this quickly. Um, if an electron or a photon or something goes through a very narrow slit, it constrains and it constrains exactly where it can be in space. As soon as we do that, what me, because of Heisenberg's uncertainty, or it, which should really could be called the indeterminacy principle, it's not uncertain, it's actually indeterminate. It says that the tighter you constrain the particle, the more crazy its momentum can be. Momentum is a vector that is, is uh, mass times the velocity. So that means that that trajectory of that particle going through could be, could be over here, could be over here. And so there's this smear of probabilities Okay. of what direction it's going. Now, the quantum wave, the Schrodinger wave, 
the evolution of, the, of that particle as it progresses along, because there's an uncertainty, and this is not an uncertainty due to our knowledge, it's actually uncertainty inherent in the universe, it actually spreads out. There's this smear of possibilities of its actual trajectory through. There's a lateral uncertainty in, in the direction. The, way, the Schrodinger wave equation, just left to its own device without measuring, will look at all those probabilities, and it will say for all those probabilities, that smear of probabilities will evolve in a classical way, a deterministic way. So there's, there's that smear is caused by the constraint, but the actual evolution of the, the quantum wave is, is classical, and it's in, in the sense of uh, it, it's determinate. But then when we measure it, when it hits the screen, you could say when it hits the photographic screen or something, at, before it does that, it could be anywhere in the universe. It could be any direction. But as soon as it hits that screen, as soon as there's a measurement done, yeah. we find it's at a, a particular position. So it collapses, reduces down to one. Now, some people say, well, here's the problem, and this is exactly the same uh, argument I'm going to use with the, with the detector, the photon detector. Where does that actual um, reductionist point happen? And it seems to be a, a nonlinear sort of reduction. Where does it happen? Does it happen on the photographic plate? Or does it happen when the, photographic, the atoms in the photographic plate interfere with this quantum particle? because that amplifies it up to being going from, you know, it sort of amplifies it in a way because now you're interacting with all these particles in, in, in another quantum system, which is actually the photographic plate. But you see that photographic plate is also made of electrons and that. Yeah. So why doesn't that follow the same quantum rules? And actually it does. It does. It actually, see, you see, um, the photographic plate, the photon detector, are also made of quantum particles. So actually, you get a quantum entanglement. Well, of course, a quantum superposition. So going back to the detector thing here, and the photon going through or not, uh, our our little pointer on the on the on the on the detector says yes. Points yes. That's the question we asked it. Yes or no? Yes. Now. That's also a quantum device. So is it not also in a state of yes and no? So now we have the quantum wave evolving for just the photon going through the mirror. But now that quantum particle is interacting with the detector and there's now a superposition of, of um, photon going through and detector saying yes, with photon being reflected and detector saying no. And so now the, the, the quantum system has just grown and it's been amplified up maybe to increase all the particles in there. But what actually does the collapse? This is a very, very critical point in the uh, theories of quantum consciousness I'm going to describe. And that's why I've gone into a lot of detail about this, and I'll be coming back to this. So where does the quantum world end and our classical view of it, our experience of the world, finish? So it's Alan Turing, the, the, the famous, um, a lot of people have heard of Alan Turing, of course, now because of all his work with computers. He was the first one who suggested that human bodies, the humans, were actually quantum amplifiers. They amplify very small, very um, subtle energies at the ground level, ground state, uh, not ground state, let's, uh, let's say in the quantum vacuum or whatever you want to talk about um, in the world. Um, up to what we define as a classical experience of the universe. Okay. All right, let's leave it like that for now. And um, he also suggested the quantum Zeno effect, or Zeno effect, quantum Zeno effect, uh, which I, I'm going to talk about as well, if I ever get there. Um, you know, <laughs> there's so much to talk about. It's a huge yeah. subject. Yeah. And I'm trying, I don't want to take too many shortcuts because we'll lose yeah. the subtlety. Yeah. So, so let's take this one step at a, at a time here. And just go, so, so von Neumann, a brilliant mathematician who actually worked with Alan Turing, they both, he, Alan Turing first came up with the sort of mechanical algorithmic way of, of talking about um, computation, basically. And von Neumann uh, sort of built on that or had his own ideas, but they interacted and they're both brilliant people. Uh, Alan, but Alan Turing's more of the mathematical computer side and von Neumann did everything. He was just a genius of a man. Not many people have heard of him, actually, but uh, he was one of the founders of quantum theory, and he put it on a very strong mathematical uh, footing. And he said he analyzed this with his brilliant mind. He analyzed this thing and said, where 
does. And he kept going. He did the same thing. Well, you know, the, this is going to be entangled or superposition state. And so he analyzed all this, saying, well, these are mixed states. So effectively interacting with the detector, it could become a mixed state of different things and rather than a superposition. But right. that's a subtlety I'll leave, I'll leave for a bit later on. And I'll come back to it. Just remember, a superposition state is when it's, it's and. Right. It's this state right. and that state. A mixed state is this state or the other quantum state. They're, they're, so they're subtly different. So if we go and, and now look at this um, from the point of view of this, uh, keep moving back and say, well, actually, uh, Eugene Wigner, um, who was a brilliant uh, physicist as well, all these critical physicists are brilliant people. Um, and and uh, he actually came up with the idea of Wigner's friend is that, well, you need an observer now to observe the that detector. And so does the human become a, a superposition of, you know, quantum particle detector says there's all these different superpositions. Well, von Neumann said, when he analyzed it back, he said there is definitely a, the, the collapse of the wave function where the quantum world becomes classical, it becomes one thing or the other. In a classical world, we only experience one, is that the mind-brain interface. Right. The mind-brain interface. So the body acts a bit like a quantum amplifier. It takes in, you know, what perceptions is. So it might be a superposition of many things even. And somewhere, uh, perceptions, which might be in a quantum state in the brain, the brain somehow collapses that into one experience. Now, how does that happen? I have no idea, but I'm going to tell you, someone else might have some ideas. Um, so a point I want to make here about the brain. So no one has been able to uh, so far explain consciousness in terms of classical physics. You, you, neuroscientists and that, I worked, I worked in a, a psychiatry department and, uh, and um, neuroscience, and nobody wants to talk about that. It's, people are starting to talk about it, but they're still talking in classical terms. So quantum, there's something about quantum, uh, quantum state. Now, we have a problem, though. First of all, a, a couple of things. One thing I will say, will say, just talk about um, generally here, is that some people see, like Descartes thought, you know, uh, dualism of mind and brain. Some neurologists, neuro neuroscientists think the brain is the mind. Huxley referred to it, you know, is, is, is the mind just the smoke above the, chim above the factory? You know, is it a byproduct? Is consciousness just a byproduct with no free will? This is the classical way of neuroscientists often uh, talk about it. It's just the, it's just a, 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 a um, illusion. Um, now, I will say also, Einstein once said the problem about um, the visual world, and he, he talked, and one thing I did want to talk about was Einstein's special relativity in terms of uh, space and time, is that t uh, space and time are also concepts we create in the, in the brain, actually. He also believed in a holistic world, and he said that the trouble with our visual process is that see, he called it the optical delusion of, of, of reality, an optical delusion, because he realized that time was an illusion. And that, but because of our visual representation of the world, um, we see it as a fixed sort of world. And I spoke about this last time, so I won't go into it too much. <laughs> Thank you.